Hello, my name's Annie Cattrall and um, I'm a visual artist and I work um, mainly in sculptural, with sculptural techniques but also time-based um, film, video and sometimes sound. Um, and I made a piece of work which was actually in two parts, Veracity 1 and 2, and uh, one, part 1 was a film and part 2 was a series of kind of drawings into uh, domestic implements. Um, and I worked with Malcolm, Professor Malcolm Gaskell um, and we had lots of dialogues and conversations to generate ideas and dovetail with his research into my responses to that. So Verosity 1 and 2 are two, although they have the same title, they were kind of iterations of the same idea. So Veracity 1 is actually a film and it's made using different states of inflamed fire and from, from lighting um, a modest candle with my hand coming in and lighting it, so igniting the flame, and then how that kind of builds up through time and actually becomes something which is fierce and almost sort of catastrophic. And then there's a whole other narrative that runs through it, which is about um, you know, mist coming down, steam, and how things have altered, and then it becomes uh, a kind of... It, go, it goes through lots of transformations. In a way, it has to be seen to be understood, but the point is that it's the idea of something very, very small, like a flame, becoming enormous and becoming sort of um, massive. And I sort of saw that as a, me a metaphor for the containment of emotions and how sometimes they can be very modest and then they can get inflamed. So the other part, veracity, two is kind of more dealing with the domestic and I, what I thought I would do is use domestic uh, implements and tools that are used in and around the home which are kind of almost universal like chopping boards, set squares, um, there's a butter pat and so forth and they've all got a kind of history uh, attached to them and also a kind of manual um, rhythm to them which would produce a particular type of gesture when somebody's used them day in day out and I was really interested in getting objects that had a had a kind of scoring like the chopping boards with lots of lines in them so it's got a kind of residue of the trace of the cutting and so forth um, and in conversation with Malcolm we talked about the idea of sort of stigmatization of particularly witches and women and how words were used um, of kind of to, um, I suppose, denigrate them. And, um, and I have a kind of whole list of these names, including um, vengeance, testimony, reputation, torment, unnatural, victim, all associated words um, around that idea. And I, I cut them into these wooden implements. So it was about the idea of say a set square being something which was a right angle to measure something and then name it putting something on top like justice. So the idea of a, a kind of um, the, the word justice and all its implications in terms of witchcraft and then the idea of something being measured domestically. I suppose my only understanding of or sort of preconceptions of early modern witchcraft work sort of actually came from childhood. Um, I'm from Edinburgh and I remember one very distinct moment when I was taken up to the kind of castle esplanade and there was an image, uh, there was a, a fountain with, with text which talked about that was where witches were burnt and, and I was really struck as a child um, imagining that was the place. Um, and I kind of remember that very distinctly and then at school actually um, we studied the crucible and that had a huge effect on, on me as well, that idea of accusation and how something can be whipped up and inflamed into something which, um, you know, you almost really question your whole kind of belief system. And that interested me as a child and, and has still interested me now. And particularly in these times of uh, fake news, it feels very, very relevant. Um, you know, if somebody says it often enough, you kind of begin to believe it. Um, so, so those were my early sort of thoughts. And then I, I suppose after that, always being aware of it as being a very pejorative kind of thing to call somebody a witch um, as an adult or as a, you know, it was a kind of a, a kind of rude word, really. Um, and then 
the way that women would always be perhaps older and, you know, kind of have these sort of exaggerated chins, exaggerated sort of uh, physiognomy, which is sort of felt like it wasn't, it was cruel. To be honest, I really responded to a lot of what Malcolm was saying and the group as a whole when we met. Uh, we had various meetings. We went to Cambridge University about two years ago and had a wonderful kind of day of looking at manuscripts and there were, there, you know, the range over hundreds of years of kind of how witchcraft had had, had developed and the so it was a kind of education for me as much as kind of being inspiring and it was actually quite difficult to even kind of pin down some one particular thing that influenced me most. But I think I was um, really kind of excited by the kind of etchings, which has got some printouts here, uh, the sort of early medieval um, depictions of witches and the environment that they were in. And um, also the apotropaic marks that I saw, well, um, Malcolm told me about them. There was actually some in the Loch Fine Oyster Bar in, in Cambridge, which we went to see that afternoon. And um, so there are these marks of kind of in buildings to um, try to make the building safe from demons and witches and all the bad things. Um, and I realised I'd noticed these actually in, in, in old buildings in the past. Actually, I'd noticed them and not really kind of realised what they were. Um, so that was a very interesting part of it and it influenced the chopping boards and the work that I did with, with wood. Um, I think also just the terminology of the way that Malcolm talked uh, and the way that he kind of references the past and how that comes into the present now. And that really interested me about Spellbound was, was the, the idea of the kind of magical thinking and the, and the way that we're still affected by these large ideas. They're still relevant. You know, they're not in the past, they're not fairy tales, they're actually incredibly relevant and they still um, are embedded in our culture now. So it was those sorts of conversations that they had, we had and they were kind of wide ranging. And then of course, again, coming from Scotland, there was the um, story of Helen Duncan and his book about her and um, her sort of having seances and being the last person to be tried with um, the Old Bailey for witchcraft in the 20th century. I was also really interested uh, that day we went to Cambridge University to the library and uh, in, in the, the actual handwriting from the 17th century uh, witch um, trials and it was sort of really interesting, beautiful kind of calligraphy. I mean it was almost very difficult for me to actually understand what was being written but it was the sort of uh, aesthetic as well as the kind of urgency of it that I really responded to and I think that really did inform Veracity 2 which um, has this element of handwriting in it um, and the handwritten and also kind of I also in that piece um, scored out areas on top of the writing too to almost look as if I was erasing it or trying to kind of get rid of it um, that's a very kind of deliberate part of that work. One of the most challenging aspects of, of sort of interpreting or responding to Malcolm's um, research, I suppose, was its breadth, really. It felt like um, there was so much I could... Um, and I, and I really, really did not want to illustrate it. I wanted to do, make a very genuine kind of response, um, which was kind of chimed with my practice as an artist and my approach. But whenever I tried to do that, I found it um, quite difficult to find a way in. And also there was the element of the other exhibits within that particular room because of the three, chain, the three sort of thematic um, rooms. So I wanted to respond to, or, or be aware of, as I was made aware of, because we had lists of all the different exhibits that were going to be in that room and talking to the architects and Sanjay about where my piece would go within it. And their concept of these kind of chambers within the rooms and room, you know, and the kind of walls and the semi -permeab the permeability of that, um, you know, it all felt like it needed to be part of the thinking 
for the end result. Um, so it just took time, but when I got it, uh, this idea of the kind of metaphor of the flame for the emotions and then the cutting of the domestic objects, or the domestic implements like the chopping board and the set square and the butter pat and the knife and so forth, and began to kind of be, sort of think of it kind of more inventively. Um, and it almost felt a little bit like, um, at times, but um, like there was a slight reenactment of something going on. The, the, the theatricality of the flames, the theatricality of the cutting, the exaggeration of everything, everything was far more than I would, um, you know, everything was kind of exaggerated. There's a sort of dramatic element to, to the work that I've shown in Spellbound, which is probably slightly different from what I would normally do. But having said that, what's great about it is it feels like it's opened a whole load of other doors. So I think one of the most rewarding parts of it was just the dialogues, actually. I mean, I think we, we, I found when I was speaking with Malcolm that we just, one thing just led to another, one conversation, um, you know, it was very interdisciplinary. Um, you know, I've been involved in other projects where perhaps I've been working with scientists and, you know, occasionally scientific historians, but what was very really, and it has always been really, really interesting, um, a lot of it depends on personality, obviously, as well as subject matter. And I found, I found Malcolm was very open to questioning. He was very good at responding and finding ways in to my work as well. And I, uh, we had a, a visit to my studio about 18 months ago, and we all sat around the group, the curators, and um, lots of different people. And the dialogue, it just went on and on, and we went from one piece of my work and, and, and how that kind of connected to the theme and so forth, or didn't for that matter, actually. That was quite interesting too. Um, so we talked quite a lot about sensibility. We talked about kind of the poetics of, you know, making a piece of work, how, how to make something contemporary within this context in terms of a voice. Um, where the personal comes into it for me um, was, was one a kind of discussion point that we have. So there was lots and lots of things and I just felt it was very, very open. And it was, that's what allowed me a kind of freedom just to explore things. And I think what was great was that um, there was a sort of element of trust, which was really important in my creative process, that, that it felt like even though it didn't happen immediately, I didn't respond immediately to uh, Malcolm's research, but he could see, I think, that I was really trying to understand it and trying to get, a, for want of a better expression, a kind of angle on it that would allow me in. Um, and that was, I think, that there was a kind of mutual understanding there, which was great. It's difficult to kind of really pinpoint if it's changed. I mean, I hopefully it's that I've learned a lot more about it all and the detail and the kind of um, appreciation, I think, of the subject matter and the fact that it's still alive and kicking, which was really something that I, I think I was probably aware of, but perhaps didn't fully understand or, or, you know, kind of was aware of. And I think, you know, with the kind of wonderful essays in the catalogue, um, you know, reading them and, and just going around the exhibition on a number of occasions with friends and colleagues that it's just really kind of deepened my understanding of the subject matter. So I think um, I benefited enormously from being part of this collaborative process with Malcolm and the team. Um, the making work as I do, and I do work with lots of people to help me make the work generally but it's it's pretty much a solitary occupation really being an artist um, so to have dialogues with Malcolm about ideas I could email him he'd be right back to me very quickly about you know just a small question he'd be pretty much on return um, if he could and um, and that was great just small things it didn't have to be a major kind of pivotal moment it was just like a, a nuance of something um, of clarification or of expanding on something 
So that was a really nice kind of dialogue and I really kind of benefited from that. And also when I sent him work, like I sent him some of the, the rough stuff before we started to really edit um, in terms of the film, you know, he completely got where I was coming from. So that is unusual because, you know, sometimes people as, as incredibly um, well versed as they are in their own subject, maybe aren't particularly visual or maybe aren't particularly sort of open um, or take things very literally. Well, Malcolm didn't, and that was a real, real, really nice kind of uh, creative dialogue there. So I benefited from that. And I think, I mean, we have kind of had rough discussions about the possibility of pro continuing something at some stage, nothing definite at all. But, you know, I think there's a door open there, it feels. and. And that's nice because it kind of keeps my imagination going. Um, it also allowed me having a bit of support, institutional support as well, to um, do something I wouldn't normally have done. I don't tend to work with film, um, but I did in this case. And I worked with Suki Best who helped me edit the films. So there was lots of new things for me about this and I benefited enormously from, from those. I'm not, I wasn't aware of being a magical thinker before, but being engaged in the show and talking to all the curators and seeing all the exhibits and thinking about magical thinking in relationship to, I suppose, um, how we imbue things in objects, for example. I mean, I make things all the time and I kind of embed um, memory, um, ideas, concepts, everything in object. So I think I always kind of believe there's something there anyway, and whether or not you could describe that as magical thinking is debatable, but I think the idea of magical thinking is kind of something that will, will always stay with me now. Uh, I'm not sure if I believe in it anymore, but I certainly feel like I'm, it's there within the kind of coordinates of, because I'm so such a pragmatist and so sort of scientific in outlook, um, that I think actually it's done me good. It's kind of recalibrated me a little bit and made me think in a way that, about the imagination more um, and how that can be kind of embedded in work and the narratives that can happen as a result of that magical thinking.